Super. Okay, good morning. Um, I've just had the most hair-raising um, drive here, so my heart rate is still pretty high. Um, added to the fact that I have an acute case of imposter syndrome, in that I'm a physiotherapist who is not a sports physiotherapist. I've never practiced in the field of sport. I was never a super sports person. I was an athlete for a while, and I spent a lot of time in the Harriers and Athletic Club at the university when I was an undergraduate, far more time working uh, out with them and running with them than doing my physiotherapy. Um, so, but I am going to talk a bit about um, physiotherapy leadership, uh, not in fact physiotherapy leadership, but leadership um, in the field. And I've, I've tried to sort of touch on the field of sport and, and sports and exercise medicine. Um, and so today I just want to um, identify that I won't be discussing any off-label products, uh, unapproved drugs, anything like that at all, way outside my area of competence even if I wanted to, but I do want to declare, obviously, that I am the president of the World Confederation for Physical Therapy, and I will be mentioning our Congress, which is happening next May, uh, and also I will be highlighting the International Federation of Sports Physical Therapists, which is a subgroup of WCPT, so that may or may not be perceived as a conflict of interest, so I'm just putting it out there, full disclosure. I was asked to talk about leadership and to talk a little bit about the lived experience, but also to talk about the research primarily. And so it's a big topic, so you're going to go away with perhaps one learning, uh, in the end of this. Um, and what I'd like to do is just introduce you to some concepts around leadership, perhaps give you a framework to start unpacking it a little bit, talk a little bit about why I'm seeing it coming through in the literature um, um, more, more recently and certainly in, in conferences around um, your practice, um, for you to perhaps recognize some possible areas of self-reflection or development, um, either in your teams or as individuals or within the organization, and then just to touch on briefly the role of global communities in these kind of conversations. Um, most of you will know about leadership. Um, we often understand leadership, and it's often articulated um, more accessibly when it doesn't go well, when it goes slightly pear-shaped. So in other words, we, we, we hear more stories about perhaps bad leadership than, than unpacking good leadership. And so when we were starting out our research journey um, many years ago um, in, 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 in Trinity, we were really struggling for a way of contextualizing the type of reading that we were doing, the type of research that we were doing, the type of conversations that we were having, the type of education that we were providing our undergraduates and our postgraduate uh, um, professional development. And this is a really interesting framework, and it's the one that I'm going to use to situate some of the conversations that I'm going to touch on today. And um, it is actually from the King's Fund, um, and it, it does describe, uh, you know, recent trends in, in the research and practice of leadership in, in public and voluntary service sectors. This is not a public or a voluntary service sector. Nevertheless, actually, the framework is one that's really useful in terms of just discussing aspects of leadership. And they talk about the six C's. They talk about concepts, contexts, characteristics, challenges, capabilities, and consequences. And consequences are actually not what you would immediately think about as the consequences of either good leadership or bad leadership. They're actually the consequences of leadership development programs. So I'm not going to spend any time on that today except to say that there's very little research out there from a systematic review that we've just recently completed on the impact of leadership development programs and workshops on um, changing um, perhaps practice, uh, which is interesting because that's a gap, I think, that's one worth considering. So let's talk a little bit about the conceptualization of um, leadership, because a lot of the time when we're talking about leadership, it's that notion of the romance of leadership, you know, the people that are in leadership roles, um, you know, the idea of the good characteristics that people demonstrate when they're talking about leadership. And interestingly, this notion of the critical leadership studies is a whole area that's starting to unpack the darker aspects of leadership. The ones that we probably don't surface a lot and the ones that we don't necessarily even consider when we're doing leadership development workshops, when we talk about the positive attributes of leadership, without being very clear that leadership has darker aspects to it. Um, and there's a very interesting paper that I'm going to that touch on um, that's just been recently published um, that a commentary around leadership and leadership models in your field, and also the notion of how we use the dark sides of leadership. So power, narcissism, manipulation, um, all of those things that we don't necessarily talk about and express uh, as leadership behaviors. And yet, this is something that obviously is important for us to understand and to be able to recognize when we're either using it or we are um, 
uh, in receipt of those behaviors or you know, part of those behaviors. The definitions that we used for the purpose of our research was because, again, there were very few definitions that we felt fitted into the practice of, of, of our profession, was an individual who influences the actions of another individual or group towards accomplishing goals and sets the pace and direction of change while facilita facilitating innovative practice. So when we're talking about conceptualizing leadership for ourselves, but also as teams and, and also as organizations, it's really important that we actually are very intentional about um, ensuring we have a common understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about leadership. Um, surfacing and having clear conversations about common understandings um, are, are, are conversations that are really worth investing in. Um, and it's, it, it might seem very simple, but if you start to, if you're starting, if you're in a project at the moment um, and you spend a few moments uh, going around the table asking people what their understanding of the project is, you'd be amazed at the extent to which, even if you all think you actually have a common understanding, if you, if you clearly say to someone, what do you think we're doing here? What do you think we want to achieve? How do you think we want to achieve it? You'd be amazed at how different people's perceptions are. And that's fine if we know that there are different perceptions. It's not fine if you actually are all in a different place thinking you're going on the same journey. So let's have a little look at this then. This is two, these are, I don't know if anyone has read these, but these are fascinating, two fascinating papers. I was really curious about the models of leadership that you use in your field. Um, because again, I'm coming from a professional organization field, so my models might be slightly different. So this was a paper that was published uh, by Cruikshank and Collins um, back in uh, 2016. And this, and this is their definition of what they, they saw as leadership. So again, we see leadership as a process involving influence over or with others, occurring within a group context and focused on achievement of shared goals. Again, presupposes that the shared goals are actually truly understood and shared. Um, and our points apply to anyone who is directly accountable for leading performers in sport. The leadership acts of figures such as coaches, team managers, and sports stroke performance directors. But in their definition, they don't refer to leaders within the administrative or business arms of sports organizations, although they do suggest that what they are talking about applies to them. Now, what this paper talks about is it starts to talk about narcissism and manipulative behaviors and the darker side of leadership behaviors within the context of sport and how they might be used. And they were saying that notwithstanding these behaviors, if they are, it was, a, it was sort of a bit Machiavellian. In other words, they're not bad behaviors if the end is a good end. So in other words, if you want to manipulate somebody to achieve better performance, that's okay. So I was really quite taken aback because it's an interesting paper. It was challenging a lot of my sort of values around leadership. Um, but if you do read this, take the time to read this one because this challenges it completely and starts to unpack a lot of the assumptions around the leadership models that are being made in this paper. So again, a little perhaps um, dry in some ways, and yet at the same time, if you start to really unpack your understanding about leadership behaviors and what's acceptable within your organization or your team or your department, it's actually starting to get very interesting. And I'm, that, this is why I'm, I really, that Jan is here, because I've, I've just, I unpacked a couple of the papers that you've recently published around some of the behaviors as well. So context is really important. So when we do leadership development, we contextualize it. So your context is different to a university context in some ways. Culturally, contexts are quite different, although I'm reassured, having spent two months in, in uh, Qatar University, that universities are the same the world over. Um, there's all sorts of bureaucracy, and there's all sorts of procedures, everyone's fighting over space, and the dynamics, even though it might be situated in an entirely different country and an entirely different culture, university culture seems to be the same the world over. But your context is going to be quite different. So you're going to have an athlete leadership context, you're going to have a coach leadership context, you're going to have an organizational leadership context, and you're going to have an, a, an owner's or a governance leadership context. And again, leadership can be quite different in all of those spaces. And, and it's worth always, you know, again, when you're taking on a new project or coming into a new position, is to try and understand the context because context can be hugely important, particularly when it comes to change initiatives. 
And again, one of the things that I've learned from working with, with organizations and groups is if you don't unpack a context, if you don't do a situational analysis, you can spend an awful lot of time and energy um, on something that just simply is not going to work because of timing. So using something like a pestle, you know, looking at the, the politics, the um, economics, the social environment, the technological environment, the legal environment, and the actual environment itself, the space sometimes, is a really interesting model. Leadership will be different uh, depending on your context. But also, um, you know, we are now increasingly um, focusing on what are called wicked problems. So wicked problems in your world will be wicked different pro problems to, you know, the tame problems. The tame problems are things that we can sort out within our current resources. Wicked problems are far more challenging. So a wicked problem, perhaps in the context of sport, would be the management of concussion. Uh, you know, a wicked problem where there are multiple stakeholders with any number of different reasons why they want this problem solved in a particular way or managed in a particular way could be one example. Doping uh, is another wicked problem because, again, it's trying to create sort of clear solutions but with multiple stakeholders and very little control potentially on the process itself. So context really matters. And this, was, this is a really interesting um, way of, uh, this is the um, Sport New Zealand um, strategy document where they've really, really been intentional about unpacking their context in, in a really nice and accessible way because what they've talked about is this notion of three elements within their strategy, purpose, culture, and being able to deliver their strategy. And they talk about this notion of context here in the idea of where my leadership shows up. So me, as a, an individual, as a role model, in a team context, but also in my communities. Um, and also then, within this, they talk about the idea of the leadership journey. So the notion that we have to be able to lead ourselves. If you don't know about yourself and your own ability uh, or behaviors as a leader, it's very hard to get involved in leading others. And leadership, when I talk about this, is not hierarchical. So this is not um, the head of research or the head of uh, the chief medical officer or the head of physiotherapy or the head of medicine. This is this concept of leadership being distributed. So you are all responsible as leaders within this organization to ensure that the, the best practice happens, that innovation happens, and um, the notion of constellations of leadership is that actually, you know, a project may start with the head of research leading it, and then it moves on to the head of physiotherapy leading it, who then might hand the baton on to the head of um, a particular clinic leading it, or a particular functional unit. So the notion of constellations of leadership are that you pass the baton, that no one person is responsible for leading the journey the whole way through. Now, obviously, Ultimately, the buck is going to stop with whoever's leading the organization or chairing the board. But along the journey, um, that can be anybody's responsibility. So you can be a team member leading teams. You can be a person leading the leaders, leading the organization, or then the governance of the um, organization. And again, this is a really nice way of thinking about where leadership behaviors are situated and what is required, or indeed, where the failures are happening. Because the culture of an organization can often be set here and here, and it will cascade down to here and here. But again, it's a question of, are your cultures bumping into one another? Do you have a shared organizational culture? Or is your, your team, does it have a very different culture to the organizational culture? So for instance, um, and I'm, it, it wouldn't happen in this organization, but, but it happens in organizations. Um, where the organizational culture is, it can become very toxic. So, or the organizational culture is such that individuals within the organization find themselves challenged hugely from their values perspective. And that's where understanding your values as an individual become really important, especially if there's a big shift in organizational culture. And so at some point, um, you may find that your values, your personal values, are challenged too significantly, and you have to leave the organization. Now, that can be at the, at the level of a team, um, or it can be at the level of an organization. So for instance, I'm sure there are times that you've been on a committee or in a team where a set of behaviors have been intensely challenging to you. Now, you can you may not have the choice to leave, right? You, there's bills to be paid, it's a job to have, it's part of your career path. And you have tried to change the behaviors 
But this is really challenging, particularly when there's a culture of workplace bullying, where you see other people being bullied, or one sees other people being bullied. It's very hard to, to challenge that. And so often what happens is people leave. They just can't challenge it, and it becomes too much, so they leave the organization. And so what happens is the problem is never dealt with. And what you end up having is you, you have the good people leaving. So again, organizational culture is incredibly important to understand. So this is how they have just simply articulated their strategic plan. They've talked about their communities, their teams, the individuals. They've talked about their purpose, their culture, and their delivery. And then how they will do it is around collaboration and navigating complexity. So a very complicated matrix in many ways beautifully simply presented and situated in the context of sport for a nation. So when we talk about the characteristics of leadership, what are the characteristics of leadership in your world? This is show and tell. I'm stopping to take a drink of water. In your, in, in this, no, in, in, I suppose in sports and exercise medicine, in, in, in your field, or in just in your personal beliefs, what do you see as being characteristics of a good leader? Okay, listen carefully, because this is going to be really interesting in terms of what you know, other people think about leadership. So outcomes driven, process driven. Not about the people, about the processes and the outcomes. Okay, so what does that mean that's about? Okay. <laughs> that's going to be an interesting post lecture coffee conversation. So, what else? Okay, silence, because, thank you. I'm being saved by the physios in the room, let me tell you. I'm going to be picking on a few people in a few minutes. Yes. Absolutely. Jan, would you like to tell us what you think are characteristics of a good leader? No, I, see, I see it in, I'm used to team sports. Yep. I see that a leader is, uh, a good leader is one who can make a team to achieve more than the individual. Great. Okay, super. So, collaborative endeavor and collaborative advantage creating added value. The leader has to bring that people together. Okay. Yes. Communication. Great. Okay. So we've got we've got some technical aspects. We've got um, team working and raising everyone's game. We've got communication. We've got the people skills. You got any suggestions? Mm -hmm. They've covered it all. Anything that's been left out? Okay. So, again, leadership is really situational and, cont and contextual. It's contingent. So, Jan put it very nicely because he said, my experience is team sports. So, that's your context. So, Rod's experience is around running a department, leading a, a big service. So, again, very contextual. Okay? So, again... Characteristics are really situational. They can be formal and informal roles of leadership. And leadership can be political. And that's, you know, both the big P and the small P. It can be managerial. And it can be clinical. And again, they're quite different potential expectations around leadership. And again, what we talked about is considering the uh, institutional environment. And again, the notion of dispersed leadership, collaborative leadership, as opposed to hierarchical leadership. And John Cotter has done some really interesting work um, around leading, uh, taking opportunities to lead change and leading. He has a great seminal paper called Why Transformation Efforts Fail. Have, have any of you read it? Okay, it's a great paper that talks about why transformational efforts fail. And he talks about a really interesting eight-step process around leading change. And it's, it's the reason why transformational efforts fail in organizations. But he's recently reviewed 
his model. And what he's talked about is this notion, and you can see it, it's emerging in a number of different sources of literature around change in organizations, which is that traditionally we focused on the hierarchy. So the hierarchy is required for structure. It's, it's the process that we need to go through to get stuff done. But to be really innovative and to be really responsive to opportunity, we need that much bigger cloud of a network. And so Cotter talks about this dual operating system, which is coming through as well in a lot of the research that's been done in health organizations around this notion that to really be responsive to innovation, to be able to seize opportunities, we need both the hierarchy and the dispersed leadership model of allowing innovation to come from the edges and be brought forward. Or equally, for, culture, for changes to happen in the organization, to be engaged in a wider network and not just to use the hierarchical approaches uh, and the structures that exist. So this is your paper, which I had a look at. And I was uh, super interested in it. Um, so I'm guessing most of you have read this paper. If you haven't, probably a good idea to read it, um, just because the boss is sitting in the front row. But if you read this paper in this room, I'm suggesting, and I could be wrong, that you guys were focusing on this, OK? So the really important part of this paper is the injury aspect of it. So the injury burden, the in incidence of severe injuries, the attendance at training, and the availability for masters. Would that be a reasonable assumption? Yeah, OK. So interestingly, when I look at a paper like this, this is the bit that I look at. So I'm not, it's not that I'm not interested in the injuries. But clearly, I don't live sports injuries every day. But I do live a lot of leadership stuff every day. So this is what was uh, used in this paper to um, look at leadership. So it's called the Global Transformational Leadership Scale. And of course, when you're reading this paper and you're interested in the, the sports injuries aspect of it, you might not necessarily drill down into the leadership aspect of it. So I took the liberty of drilling down into the leadership aspect of it, just for curiosity. So seven statements are, this is a valid and reliable scale. It's been used in a wide variety of contexts. And it has seven statements within it. And um, you rate them from rarely or never to very frequently, or if, you know, if not always. And team doctors were asked to rate their club's head coaches. If I'm getting this wrong, put your hand up. And then the seven scores were combined to get a mean. So if you've got a, so a high score, high transformational leadership. Transformational leadership is associated with better outcomes than transactional leadership. Transactional leadership is a bit like my conversation the other day, if you do this for us, we will give you this. Transformational leadership is around embracing wider set of concepts. So what wasn't in the paper, because of word count limitations, I've no doubt, is what that scale actually measures. So that scale, we'll go back to it, team doctors were asked to look at their head coaches and scale, rank them on this set of criteria communicates a clear and positive vision of the future, treats staff as individuals, supports and encourages their development, fosters trust, involvement, and cooperation among team members, encourages thinking about problems in new ways and questions assumptions, leads by example, is clear about his or her values and practices what she preaches, and charisma, instills pride, respect in others, and inspires by being highly competent. So a score of one or two is somewhere along here. So these people were not covering themselves in glory on these domains. And a score of five would be, they do it most of the time. So. These are the results. So a score of low was 1 to 2 on that scale. A score of moderate was 3. And a score of high was 4 to 5. 1 in 5 coaches rarely or never displayed the above behaviors. Now that's astonishing. That's 20% of coaches never or rarely displaying a set of behaviors that I would believe are just basic human decency. So my first question would not be about the injuries and the injury prevention. My first question would be, how are they seeing their jobs? What are we doing in this world? 
where that's okay. Now, of course, this is the really important information as well, because of course, you know, this had an impact on these key outcomes for your work, which was injury burden and incidence of severities of injuries. This is really important. So what I found fascinating, um, and this is not a criticism of, uh, of, 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 of the, um, the, the, the journal, BJSM, because Grim would knock me over the head if I criticized BJSM, but it's really interesting sometimes when we look at papers like this, what frame we're in when we're looking at it. Because for me, the interesting piece around this would be, how do we make this better? Because 47% scored one to three, which is not super. Now, okay, it does mean that, you know, the majority were, were up there in the high end of things, but that's still probably not enough. I don't know, I mean, would you agree? So I'm just flagging it up there to you, but that's a really interesting, uh, and, and again, not immediately available within that paper because the detail of what was actually, what that transformational leadership means when you go into work and work with this person every day is unpacked in the scale. So it's a really lovely paper. And I'm, I'm just sorry that, we, that that information wasn't necessarily given in an annex, because I think it's really important for how you maybe look at various things in your work. Um, and then the other question, again, is leadership to what end? And I suppose this is where it comes back to Rod's point, which is, you know, leadership can be about process um, uh, and about outcome. And that's often, you know, what we look at. And that paper was looking at, you know, to what end is leadership important? And in, in this paper, it was the, to the end, which is, you know, if leadership is good, then this has an impact potentially on, now we can't draw cause and effect, and I'm not suggesting that good leaders, you know, necessarily would, you know, prevent injuries, but nevertheless, it creates the culture within an organization that enables certain things to happen. So re research has often been focused on the person and the process, but not the purpose. And again, one of the key challenges is around, um, you know, what is the purpose of good leadership? You know, what is, the, and, and it comes back to, the purpose of good leadership is that we serve the patients and the clients, and we ensure team performance is optimal. Now, interestingly, the purpose of good leadership in other organizations might be about the bottom line. And again, the question about, you know, how does the financial bottom line impact on our behaviors within an organization, and whether there's tension points between the two of them is always one to consider. But again, the concept of um, perceptual aspect of leadership is one that I think we've just seen really interestingly in this room when we talk about the characteristics of leadership, which is that my purpose within an organization might be quite different to someone else's purpose within an organization, and that is going to frame how I behave in that organization. So as I was checking yesterday, um, I found this paper. So, um, and again, I was really curious, not Again, because it's not that I'm not interested in the injury end of things, but I'm interested, again, in the communication end of things. Um, and this was another really interesting one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this uh, because I'm curious about how, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in a framework of this, which is a member of the medical staff on each team completed a questionnaire to describe their perceptions of the quality of communication within the club. That's quite one way, right? So it's how do I think you all are communicating one another, which is, which is interesting. I'm, I'm going to just talk to that a little bit later on. And again, Likert scale, low, moderate, and high. And I was just reassured with this result, which is physios and doctors seem to be communicating very well in this research trial, which is really interesting. But here's, this is, I guess, some of the, this is where some of the challenges happen. This is where we're talking about why communication is so important, right? Again, this paper was looking at, and, and, and I'm not, so there is very little that is written in this way in your research at the moment around this. So that's why I'm highlighting these two papers, not because Jan happens to be in the room, although it's kind of convenient that he is, but it's just because there's actually, this type of research is really emerging in your field. So this is, this is interesting and probably not surprising, okay, but it will be interesting to see specifically who was asked and what the people on the receiving end felt, so doing about a 360. But, it, but then you start to look at where it starts to degrade a little bit as it goes, as it changes within the organization. And why that can often prove very challenging in terms of process and outcomes. 
And this is um, a, a very interesting model from a, from a very big piece of work that was done in the NHS. Again, context is important, but this is around leadership trends and transformative practice. And the notion that the dominant approach has often been power through hierarchy. In other words, the boss says we do it, so we do it. Um, we've got a mission and a vision, and we're driven by that. We make sense through rational argument. Leadership is top down. We use tried and tested. Um, everything is based on our experience, and it's transactional. If you do this for me, this will happen. The, the, the trends are very much power through connection the notion that we have a shared purpose. You make sense through emotional connection, storytelling. Um, that there's a lot of viral or grassroots uh, creativity, that there are open approaches to change, and that it's very relation, relationship oriented or transformational. Now, that's you know, probably utopia. It's the world we'd all love to live in. Um, navigating your way through this, these two sets of behaviors, is, is the key in terms of um, uh, probably teamwork and um, achieving a lot. But when we talk about capabilities, there's a lot of people we're talking about the hard skills and there's key areas around emotional intelligence. So this is a really interesting, uh, and this, if you think, so we all know that you are an immensely talented group of people in this room. And that will get you your job. What will lose you your job in a leadership role is your emotional intelligence. So IQ will get you in, EQ will have you out the door. And this is what Phil uh, Glasgow used when he was actually recruiting for Team GB. Uh, and this is his direct quote, um, because I, was, I heard him speak and I, uh, a couple of years ago, and I said, oh, look, I want that. I want that stuff. I want that method. So he did, we did, a, you know, obviously, clinically, you had to be excellent to be on Team GB. But he said, we did a wide range of activities to determine team fit. And the thing that challenged people most and had the greatest consensus among team and correlated with other findings was when we asked the following four questions. Who am I? Where am I? Where am I going? And how am I going to get there? And what was really interesting was people had four questions, four minutes, in a video. And then they reviewed the videos afterwards. And he said it was really insightful in terms of how they chose their team to come together. And so for me, that's a really classic example of the hard skills will get you over the line in terms of being appointable. The soft skills are the things that are going to actually get you working in a team together. So um, really interesting and again, very contextual to, to a team in a very high pressured environment for a period of time. So I don't know if any of you have done any of these. How many of you have done a self-awareness test about your behaviors at work? Um, have you done a Berkman, a Belbin team roles? A few of you have done them. Hands up if you've done something that tells you a little bit about yourself. Allegedly. Well, obviously there's one way of looking and another way of seeing. How many of you see the young woman here? How many of you see the old woman? How many of you can see both? How many are you still looking at her thinking, young woman, old woman, what is she talking about? Okay, that's a split second example of something that we talked about earlier, about what frame we're in when we're interacting with one another, and it's really important. So we have done some research um, on this, uh, and I'll just uh, skip through some of it, but these are, this is a really interesting, this is a set of uh, leadership characteristics that were identified as being from the leadership literature, um, and Irish physiotherapists and Canadian physiotherapists were asked to rank them as being important in their context. So, for the non-physiotherapists in the room, have a think about this and see where you might have ranked them slightly, if you would have ranked them differently. This is just, again, super biased sample on the basis that, you know, anyone who fills out a questionnaire about leadership probably is sort of self-selecting into a leadership role. But nevertheless, interesting in terms of what physiotherapists in Ireland and Canada, in both their workplace, healthcare system, and society, thought were important to our communication and professionalism. And they ranked the two uh, top characteristics across the two countries and across the three scenarios. What was really interesting was self-awareness is so low. It's just astonishing. It's like, really? God. I mean, I get professionalism and communication, but if you're not self-aware in your workplace, it can contribute to any number of challenges. And if you haven't looked at Daniel Goleman's really interesting work about emotional intelligence, fabulous, uh, great stuff on YouTube, really interesting. 
uh, papers about it. Self-awareness is understanding who we are. I am, you know, physiotherapist. I'm standing up on a stage feeling decidedly nervous amongst a group of people who are, you know, very, very key experts in their field. Um, you, that could be the perception you have of me, or you might have an entirely different perception of me. Self-knowledge is a key facet of self-awareness but also the ability to be aware of the consistency. And you just said it. As far as I'm aware, I've done these tests. They tell me something about me. But am I in my own little bubble? So actually, yes, our research would say, and much of the research would say, we are in our own little bubbles. Um, so let me just get to uh, Bowman and Deal. Talk, or, um, they talk about a variety of different frames. There's four frames that you can work in at work. OK, so the political frame is about power, negotiation, influence. Symbolic frame is about celebrating success, about creating a better version of ourselves because we work together. Um, the structural frame, process, outcomes. The human resource frame, people and relationships. Physiotherapy managers report that they use the human resource frame 60% of the time, the structural frame about half, half of their time, the political frame 9% of their time, which is probably why we're not great at power and negotiation and the symbolic frame, 20% of their time. This is what they said. We then went and asked the people who worked with them what they experienced and what they thought was important. And interestingly, they thought their, their physiotherapy managers were good at the structural frame, which is good because, you know, half of them thought they used it most of, half the time. Um, they thought they were good at the political frame, which is interesting because their, their, their bosses didn't think they were using that frame very often at all. <coughs> interestingly, the physiotherapy managers thought they used the human resource frame. 61% of them said they used it, but their staff didn't experience that. And they didn't experience the symbolic frame, which was actually aligned. But what was really important was they didn't experience the symbolic frame. They didn't experience, they felt symbolic leadership was important, and the physiotherapy managers didn't use it. So again, understanding your behaviors, what you think the way you're behaving is, and what's being received are actually quite different. And we know from any number of papers that our self-awareness is not great. Why is self-awareness important? Because in teams, it really improves decision-making quality, coordination, and conflict management. Well, there's a surprise. Any of you familiar with this? OK. This is a fabulous instrument if you're working in small groups and teams. All the Belvin team roles. Big research has been done on it that would suggest that there are nine team roles and high-functioning teams have the nine team roles, not nine people, the nine team roles. So the team role, the person with all the ideas in your team is the plant. A resource investigator is the person who has the network. So I know that the fitness coaches were doing this last year, and my friend is a fitness coach, so I'll find out what they were doing. The coordinator is the natural chair, not necessarily the person who's actually in charge of the team, but the person who's very good at chairing and bringing the team on the journey. The shaper. Any of you ever sat in a meeting and thought, preferably inside your head, but quite often outside, if they don't stop talking and start doing something, I am going to kill someone. Anyone in the room ever have those thoughts in their head? Anyone? No? OK, if you do, you're a shaper. Try and keep them in your head. They don't always land terribly well. The monitor evaluator, you know when you go with, to someone with an idea and they sit and they say, oh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know, do we have the resources? I'm not sure would the ethics committee approve it. I'm not sure if the auditor will be okay with that. The monitor evaluator, you need that person in your team. Um, the team worker is the person who keeps the team together. They remember everyone's birthday. They remember the person who got upset the last time the shaper didn't manage to keep the thoughts in their head and said them out loud. Um, the implementer is the person who, who does, takes the idea and makes a process and a plan about it. Computer finisher, are you the person who sees the document and wants to do the spell check right away? You can't read something without seeing the errors? You're desperate to get track changes onto the document. Nobody in this room ever feels like that. Really? Are you sure? Okay, interesting. That's the computer finisher. We all need them. And the specialist is, you know, I'm, I know everything about back pain, but I know nothing about anything else. You need the back pain person in when you're talking about back pain. Ideally, you have them all in your team, because if you don't, there's an opportunity to get stuck. If you do Pelvin team roles, and it is a bit of fun, you can have an opportunity to do it yourself, and then you get other people to do it about you. Now, what's really interesting is this person up here, 
thinks they're a monitor evaluator. Okay, they think they're discerning, they can make judgments on whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. If that person was experienced by other people as a monitor evaluator, there'd be more than two yellow boxes there. Okay, so clearly the person who has completed this Belbin team role is deluded about their abilities in terms of being a monitor evaluator. They might be, they might be thinking they are, but nobody who they work with experiences that. Happily, the person also thinks they're a shaper. Um, that's pretty clear. Everyone's experienced that shaper moment from them. So would you say that that person, just looking at the matching up of the colors in the boxes with the experiences people have, how many people think that that person has, demonstrates good self-awareness? Hands up if you think that that person demonstrates low self-awareness. Low self-awareness? Okay, let's do the scale that Jan used. One to two. Low, not so good. One to two, hands up. One to two. Okay, three. Four or five? Not good. That's my Belbin team roles. So why did I think I was a monitor evaluator? Why did I complete the questionnaire thinking I was a monitor evaluator? Because I wanted to be one. So I filled, I didn't do it intentionally, but I filled out the survey instrument honestly answering the way I wanted to be. Not the way anyone experiences me, and not on self-reflection, the way I am in reality. Because I am so not a monitor evaluator, it's frightening. That's why I need the ethics committee, and the audit committee, and the person saying to me, are you out of your mind? We are not doing that. And that's happily the CEO of WCPT. But that's an example of um, self-awareness. So again, there's any number of tools. This is a great one, the Clifton Strengths. Thinking about strategic thinking, executing, influence, and relationship building. And again, where are you in those frames? So Rod is probably very much in the strategic thinking, executing frame. He's probably in the influencing frame. I don't know if you think you're in the relationship building frame. But again, it's about understanding this, right? Because when you're having a conversation with someone, they're probably in there. So I'm not in there very often, if the truth be told. Um, and so often I'm having the conversation with somebody and I'm saying, I think we should do this differently. There's loads of reasons why I think we should do this differently. I think the outcomes aren't good. I think we need to be doing this. We need to be doing the process differently. And then somebody says to me, well, you know, I think everyone's a really good upset about it. You know, so when we started in WCPT three and a half years ago, our job was to transform the organization. I was in the structural space, strategic thinking, executing. Oh, so not in the relationship building space. And that's because I have to press the pause button to be sure that I am doing that because I'm, that's not my strength. It's not something, I just get on with it. You know, my pace is not intentionally uh, tuned in enough to other people a lot of the time. So again, understanding where you are in this and where your strengths are, and recognizing where someone else's strengths might be, and then signaling that starts to make those conversations easier. And it starts to minimize the risk of having the meeting that I had yesterday with the, well, if you're not giving me the rooms, let's just end the conversation now so I can find them somewhere else, because that's not helpful to anyone. This is what you get. These are the, the, the uh, words associated with them. I've color-coded them because this is some research that shows that um, there's an absence of yellow words in physiotherapists. Now, that may or may not be uh, contextual to Ireland and Canada, but again, worth thinking about, you know, have we got that mix in our team of people who can influence, who have the political power, as well as the strategic thinking, the human resources, and the execution. And this was just something that I picked up last year when Peter was writing about this, um, this particular aspect of um, the, 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 the scandal in Australian cricket. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a very fair piece, I felt, reading it as someone who didn't know very much about the whole sort of detailed context. But what I thought was really interesting, and again I picked this up, was this notion of the captains have little former leadership. So they're just expected to do the job. And yet, the pressures that are on you know, elite athletes, and we often see the kind of the end result of that. And I just thought that was a, that was a very, um, I, I thought it was just a very interesting insight into why leadership training and leadership development and spending time on it in all aspects of what we do can be really beneficial to the organization. 
which is really interesting because it's one of the things that we put in as a, as a proposal for the IOC conference. Is this about this idea of if you have injury prevention programs, you know, you can have all the science and the data, but you also need to be able to lead your team and the organization on the journey. Uh, and interestingly, with the, you know, the results of Jan's paper, be curious to see in you know, how change happens and the transformational change that happens in the clubs where you know, 41 of the coaches didn't scored well versus the others that didn't score so well on the transformational leadership scale. I'm going to give you a little plug because those physiotherapists in the audience think about this because again, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is actually interestingly the concept of leadership being very contextual and again, just a couple of interesting focus symposia that are happening. And of course, this is your global community of knowledge as physiotherapists. Um, with uh, this conference happening also in 2019 and um, two other areas where, you know, I think we're going to see more about leadership coming through in the research literature, but also in the practice. Um, and on that note, I'm just going to leave it with a simple quote is that if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, or become more, you're a leader. And so each one of you in this room does that in some way, shape, or form in your day-to-day. And therefore, I would encourage you to learn a little bit more about leadership. <laughs>